Okay, hello everybody. How are you doing today? How was your week? How is everything going? If you're in, please tell us where you're joining from. I would like to know where we're joining from today because we're talking about cultural norms and mental health. So if I know where you are, you will be able to We'll be able to talk about what what's the stigma like where you are what do you hear what do you say how do you stigmatize people because in one way or the other we also are a part of the stigma thing so let me know where are you from where are you from say hello say hi my guest will be with us shortly but while i'm waiting for my guest would you please say hello and let me know where you're joining us from that would be really cool okay all right, so <laughs> we're still on this shaming stigma. Okay, so we are turning it around. Stigma is the kind of shame or negative portrayal or negative thought or negative way of, of perceiving people uh, with mental illness. And mental health stigma is hurting all of us. How? Because when there's something wrong with you or there's something going on with you or you have a challenging time or anything that has to do with the health of your brain, you and I do not want to seek help because we don't want to be tagged as crazy, psycho, a lunatic, or a mad person or disabled person because we have a mental health issue. So it's hurting all of us. And um, according to the uh, uh, National uh, Psychiatric Association, stigma, there's three, three major types, okay? There's the self-stigma, there's public stigma, and there's institu institutionalized stigma. So <laughs> some way or from at home, even those who are mental illnesses, the way they internalize having a mental illness and deal with it hurts everyone somehow. So let's let's talk about it. To get my guest and I, Colin and I, will be focusing on public stigma today, and we're looking at it from the perspective of what happens in Africa, and then he will be sharing what what is it like to have a mental illness or how do people see perceive or treat people with mental illness in the caribbean he's from antigua and uh you know he's got a lot of exciting you know i i'm surprised that the differences we have and the similarities with from africa between africa and the caribbean so we're going to see that today and talk about it so focusing on public stigma that is when we have, it can be in form of a stereotype. People with mental illness, they're dangerous. People with mental illness, they are unreliable. People with mental illnesses, they are, um, they are, they are unreliable, they're dangerous. They should not be associated with, you cannot entrust them to do uh, something for you properly, or it is just not, it, they're just not the right fit either for your organization, for anything. It's unfair. <laughs> it is, it is inhuman. It is dangerous. It is limiting. And it is unhealthy for everyone. So public stigma is the one we're focusing on today and how can we really help? On the part of self-stigma, when people see themselves either as incompetent, they perceive themselves as dangerous, they perceive themselves as, as um, you know, less than any other person around and they don't want to do something because of that, it is, it can hurt and can limit how far they can get to. And it is this same self-stigma that is spreading around to everyone and everywhere. And then we're thinking, my goodness, 
I don't want to be like that. I don't want to associate with that. I don't want to be that person. So I want us to see the 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 bad end or the goal of this of this uh, 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 episode is to let us know why and to explain to us, you know, why mental health or mental illness stigma should be shamed and should not be promoted. Uh, and and um, um, as I'm waiting for you to tell us where you're joining from, and as I'm waiting for you to tell us what mental health stigma is like in your place, uh, I will go, and sh go ahead and share some examples. So in Africa, let's start from childhood. So a child that has any kind of mental illness that can be perceived or that is so prominent or that someone can see, say uh, somebody with on the autism spectrum or somebody that is that has like maybe Down syndrome or a child that is struggling, you know, that is not able to fit properly socially or that does not have that development, that has a developmental delay or neurodevelopmental issues, like the one I mentioned, how do people treat them? What happens mostly is the family, people around see them as, hey, they have this thing going on, their child is sick, they don't want to invite them to work, what, whatever they're doing. Sometimes they don't want them to come or whatever they're doing. They want them to um, maybe just stay in a place so that they don't disturb other people around them. It can hurt a family. A, par a, a parent, either the mom or dad, or both parents of a child that is going through a mental uh, neurodevelopmental delay can have the reluctance because they don't feel that acceptance in the society, either at the party, wherever they, they are supposed to be as a family, when they are being isolated, when they are being detached from, it's usually not a healthy thing. It's usually not good to support the child with the neurodevelopmental delay and even the parents of the child caring for this, for that, that are caring for this child. It does not help or support them. Let's give another example of epilepsy. What epilepsy, uh, I put this on because it's one of the, you know, it has to do with the communication of the, the network of the brain, how they communicate with it itself, the electric communication and network of the brain. A, a child that has epilepsy, I remember when I was in, in primary school, we had, I had a girl when I was in primary four Suddenly, in the middle of our, uh, this period, the class we were having, she just went, oh, like that, like that. She fell to the ground. She started foaming. She started having saliva, you know, saliva coming out of her mouth and stuff. And I remember then how it was like talk of the school. And we're not supposed to move close to her. And the saliva is not supposed to touch your body because Epilepsy is contagious. And when the saliva touches you, you can also start having epilepsy. And people are scared and people do not want to move closer to this girl because it's like you don't know when she's going to fall down. This kind of thing, as we are going older, as the, the children are growing, it is our place as parents, as children, as, public, as members of the public to train and to let people know any kind of illness in this case, like in the case of epilepsy, it's not a thing, a thing of shame. It's not a thing that we should now start um, um, tagging or we should start moving away or discriminating against this kind of children or individual that has the kind of this, this kind of um, illnesses. It is dangerous, it is not helpful for them. Another thing is. Um, let's talk about people with schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is a chronic mental illness. And I believe that schizophrenia is that picture, it's the mental picture that we have of mental illness. Because, because of schizophrenia, people who have schizophrenia are not in touch with reality. In, in, say they are not getting treated. 
they are not getting treatment and the or maybe in the active form of schizophrenia they are hallucinating or they are delusional they don't know what is going on they cannot care for themselves or they just they are they are detached from reality that is what people see and our media does not let me not generalize the media thing. let's say the media in africa does not help the situation and when they portray uh, anyone with mental illness at not having welcome my guest is here hi hi welcome back <laughs> yeah things happen <laughs> i know i know i'm glad you're able to make it welcome okay. back yeah i was just uh filling in while you were in here about you know uh different types of stigma self-stigma public stigma institutional institutional stigma and you know the shame associated with it and i was trying to talk about uh, different illnesses the one I, I mentioned earlier is epilepsy how people you know don't the misconception that people have instead of the information and talking about schizophrenia as schizophrenia being that mental picture people have when we talk about mental illness but it's not so but now that you're here welcome i'm gonna pause and let you introduce yourself to my to our audience and uh, tell us who you are tell us what you do and then we'll get into the the question thank okay, you okay um thank you for inviting me the name is colin john jenkins i live in antigua and barbuda which is a great country in the Caribbean. We boast 365 beaches, for <laughs> which are really lovely. We actually have one of our twin island states, Barbuda, that has pink sands. You can check it out online, or you can actually come. Um, as day-to-day -day living, I am one of the principals of this company called CJC Plus Associates Inc. Um, we have a company that focuses on sustainable designing, quantity surveying, architecture, project management, and the like. But that's not what we're actually here to talk about today. So when I'm not working with a company, sometimes I do male empowerment sessions and social work. And as well, I do um, some community work. I'm the president of our community where I live right now. And from time to time, I engage persons in conversations around various topics that affect how they live in, like what I'm doing with you right now. So um, I was really open to the dialogue that you invited me to, to talk about some of the differences between our cultures in different continents to see what it's like, really. So that's why I'm actually here today. <laughs> yes, and welcome, welcome. I'm so glad to have you again um, because we've had a very robust conversation about men's mental health before. And uh, I think maybe we should just start from there. Talking of mental health stigma, what is it like in your culture? Is it prominent? Is it not? And how do people how do people respond to mental illness generally? Let's let's call it what it is, mental illness this time. Okay, um, that's an interesting question because. There are a lot of persons who are actually on the medication for mental illnesses that we are not aware of because they are medicated. Others are, don't have that um, fortunate experience. And so they may not have the care that they need and the family support that they need. So they end up on the streets. Um, they become highly involved in substance abuse. And so what you find happening is that in terms of how we view them, they may be seen as not persons who have a handle on their life. And because we have a culture here where therapy for mental health issues is not something that's prevalent, um, going to a therapist to just simply talk about your issues is not prevalent. It's seen as a level of weakness in most parts, it's getting better now, but for the latter part of two decades, that wasn't the case. And so um, there are a lot of advocacy and advocate persons who take the center stage and try and talk about some of the things that are mental health, mental issues that we may not actually take into account because we tend to think mental, when you have mental issues, you're someone 
who have a nervous breakdown and you actually need a psychiatrist or to be in hospital, but it's not as generic as that. So it's, it's a lot more widespread. And so you have to consider all of the different things that affect mental health in that question. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you 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 touch therapy, you talk medication. You know, you talked how it's it's perceived generally. So mm -hmm. let's let's come from the you know the um, let's talk about drug use here. Uh, and when I let me say here, let me say in Africa, drug use and and alcoholism. Let's say people here with alcoholic problem, they are drunkards. You are a drunkard and you should, you know, you're not a responsible person. Most times it's the male that is, um, you know, dependent on these substances. And they're irresponsible. A lot of times it gets to where they become abusive and things like that. And mm -hmm. first, when we're talking of self-stigma. People don't want to seek help. They don't want to go to the rehab and be back. Secondly, when you go to the rehab, for those who would even summon the courage or they got the support to do that, when you come back, it's almost like, oh, you know, the stigma people get like, it's like you've gone to jail and you're back and, you know, it is just not a good thing. So it's not affecting you to get a job or to marry or to do things like that. What is it like in your culture? Well, going to therapy is not something that we do our idea of therapy it's talking to a good friend of ours uh and that friend may not necessarily have the competencies to advise you properly so sometimes that goes south very quickly because that friend may give you some bad advice or sometimes discuss your matters with the public people mm -hmm. um in relation to alcohol abuse um it's not something that we look down on a lot here. Um, alcohol consumption is not seen as a bad thing. We have a lot of um, activities, events, fets, etc., where people drink quite a bit. And to own certain liqueurs and these kind of products in your home is seen as, let's say, you have the financial way it all to do so because some of them are very expensive and so alcoholism it's you know the people talking about holding your rum like not getting drunk often um there's a place in Antigua and Barbuda where a lot of the men who constantly abuse alcohol um they gather and that's just where they are they, they, it's like a self-contained area within the city and they're just there. Um, it's, 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 not, it's not looked down upon at all. I mean, people say that he's a drunk, but it's we don't have the level of um, cultural um, um, perception of abuse with alcohol the same way as you do, which I found interesting. Um, but mm -hmm. it, it's, it's certainly not on the level that you've just described at all. Oh, okay, so if a person who uh, has alcohol um, dependence issue or see even not maybe not alcohol, just any kind of drug dependence issue. So when they come to to Antigua, it's not going to be a big deal like it is in in Africa. No, 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 no. no. When it comes to alcohol, particularly, mm -hmm. it's not seen as a shame compared to what you just described. Yeah. Okay. Um, for other types of abuse that takes place with hardcore drugs, for instance, like cocaine or crack or heroin, um, it's it's not welcomed. It's it's really not, um, especially when it gets to the point where you become a bother to society. Uh -huh. um, people are, are not for that at all. It's not socially accepted. Um, in relation to marijuana. Uh -huh. that's linked to Rastafarianism and um, general use of it. As you notice, a lot of it has been um, decriminalized around the world and now commercialized around the world. Uh -huh. That in and of itself had a dark past in Antigua because um, the Rastafarians themselves were um, 
abused by law enforcement, mm -hmm. um, especially persons with dreadlocks. Similar to Bob Marley, they were not welcomed uh, two, three decades ago. Um, because we have a predominant Christian society, mm. it was seen as um, you going away from the principles of Christianity. So parents had an issue with you dating their children. As the last feeling is whether it's a man or a woman, they didn't think that you were of substance. Um, and few had access to some of the same privileges as we do. Um, it's recently as well that schools allow them into the curriculum without an issue um so they come to schools now with their locks it's not a problem and even in relation to the pandemic there has been an exemption for them where vaccines are concerned within the society because it's part of their religion their core religion about what they consume in their bodies um so Marijuana use is not frowned upon nearly like before. The concern that we have as a general society is the use of it where young people, especially below the age of 18, is concerned. That is where there is a, a concern, or, or I should say, um, some conversation about it not being the right thing because of access to that sort of drug, because it's being decriminalized. So you're allowed. Um, four plants in and around your, your living space and a certain amount, like I think it's one spliff in your person and police would generally not um, incarcerate you for that. For that, wow. Okay, okay, I see. So um, what's it like, do, do let, let's talk about like, well, like you said, there's a difference between alcoholism, the response or the acceptance of alcohol use uh, from the Caribbean to, to what happens in Africa. But let's talk about seeking help. When people go to rehab and they come back, do people encourage going to rehab? Do families support them? Uh, what is what is that like if, if you're known to have gone to rehab and come back? Okay, well, there is an encouragement for persons to seek help. Let me put that in, in inverted commas. Because we do have counselors, we do have psychologists, uh, we do have um, some access to, to these sort of assistance, but it's not prevalent in terms of it's not common for persons to go and get these kind of access to this sort of help. It's only recently we're trying to really do a lot of awareness where mental health is concerned so people know that this exists. There are facilities geared towards that, um, which are for overseas persons. So it's almost like a, um, a wellness and health center that's for the rich and wealthy. But they do give back to society by allowing certain amount of spaces for local persons to access the services. Apart from that, we do have a mental, a mental institute here, which tends to be seen as access for persons on the low end of society. And years ago, it was frowned upon, really. Uh, and you can tell by the way it's called that the official name is Clearview, the Clearview Psychiatric um, Facility. But in the local vernacular, we call it Crazy House. Oh, okay. So you, That's you, what I'm talking about. They call right, it Crazy so House. Crazy House. So you, you immediately see that, you know, when you go up there, you, you have that label attached to you. Mm -hmm. when, when you come out so that in and of itself is a problem yes yes and um so terms like this t tell me talking about crazy house what are the other terms uh you use over there to describe someone with a mental illness i'll tell you two in our place it's um we say in my language you say alagono or you say uh kolo mm -hmm. We say that. What, what are the things you say in your place? They're not right in their head. Mm -hmm. They're crazy. Mm -hmm. They're mad. They're mad. Mm -hmm. uh, let me ask this. Do you have mad men in the Caribbean? You have people you call mad men in the Caribbean. Say they're somebody that lives or stays in the market or someone who roams about. 
and you know without clothes and begging for food uh that people run away from like when they're coming like, is a madman is a madman and people run away does that happen yeah we, we call we call him crazy man crazy man mm. okay and when people talk about mental illness is that do you think that's the kind of p mental picture people have of mental illness right generally speaking yes so it's the same in your context yes yeah yes. we do okay mm -hmm. Um, so here's another one I want us to talk about. I don't know what it's like over there, but with media or say entertainment industry, there, I don't want to be too specific, but in the entertainment industry, when in our movies, we see people, they, they portray, they show mad people delivering spiritual messages. Like a mad person saw something, I will come and tell you, don't go there, don't do this thing. And that was God telling you not to do that. We see it a lot in movies here, or you they show a mad person with children singing and clapping and say, hey, mad person, mad, and the, or maybe the person is dancing. That's the kind of things we see uh sometimes in our in our movies here. What's it like in, in the Caribbean? It's it's a bit similar. Um we don't really have persons running behind the 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 the, the person with the illness and mocking them per se. Although it happens from time to time. So when I was younger, we would tease the person and they would throw stones and the children would run. So but I don't find it happen as much now where you may have an issue, which one time I actually had to save someone in that position. There was a gentleman, he has a condition where I think he got into an accident previously. And he has a condition where he sort of ticks, like, like he has sporadic convulsions when he's walking we call it and, ticks. right and when he gets to or a vehicle passes him he gets worse mm. so this one time he took up a little pebble of a stone and threw it at the vehicle and the guy came out and was going to beat him so i said to the guy look it's, it's not worth it he doesn't know what he's doing so the guy decided to leave him alone and, and went along so people like that move around People feed them, but then that's about it because the family are incapable of taking care of them. And we generally don't have facilities that cater to these kind of people. And then there's an issue with consent, with the families consenting to the state being custodians of them. Sometimes when they get into the facilities, they don't stay there. They leave, you know. So it's, it's a very difficult, very, very difficult situation. But you find mainly the men are on that side uh, in, comp in comparison to the women being at that exact level or state of, of, of um, abandonment. Oh, mental illness, yes. Um, no. You know, so interestingly, you mentioned men. And uh, when you, you started, you talked about we don't do therapy here. Like, you don't go and see a psychiatrist or see a therapist and just sit, sit down there and be talking about what's going on with you. Let's talk about how stigma and masculinity or stigma and male, the, the, the male gender, how is stigma holding men back from seeking help in the Caribbean? Well, a lot of it has to actually do with our, our queens, our women counterparts as well. It's not just a men thing. Let me tell you, um, I'm a firm believer that even though we are intellectual beings, a lot of the laws of the nature still apply. Um, you would want someone as a woman that can protect you and that can provide for you. Um, sometimes the men themselves feel this pressure, so they think they need to provide, they need to protect. And uh, they need to please, whether it's physically, mentally, etc. They they tend to be givers. They want to solve issues, and when they're unable to do that, it's a real problem um, for them. And they're not taught how to cope with this. So how they exhibit their issues can be uh, misleading. So in the sense that they're angry. They're unable to finish their sentences. They're unable to articulate themselves properly. And um, because of the stigma of them um, not 
showing this kind of weakness, it goes down the tunnel. So you may suffer from anxiety and you don't quite know how to deal with it. And so you break down, um, you're having issues in your relationship and your first line of, of looking at resolving the issue is killing yourself or harming yourself or harming the person that you're with. So it's, it's a challenge here. Um, we don't necessarily have support groups like that. Um, the church tends to be one of the institutions that a lot of persons go to to seek sort of help from talking to a pastor uh, and so on. So we use religion a lot to fill that gap in opposed to trained professionals because um, there's a concern that your business will be spread out there and then, of course, people seeing you going to these sessions and so on and thinking less of you. Okay, Colin, do you, I know that reduced mental illness stigma would help all of us. Because it's because of the stigma that we have out there that people are reluctant. One of the, one of the consequences of, of stigma, of mental illness stigma, is reluctance to seek help. Mm -hmm. Another one is the shame. Another mm -hmm. one is reduced self-esteem for the per people with mental illness. You know, another one is just the self-doubt. A lot of things like that. But that reluctance to seek help is the one that is, that I think hurts us most generally. Because someone who has a mental illness, whether or not it's diagnosed, it reduces the quality of life. So when we're able to diagnose it and then get treatment, it helps us function better. I agree. What can we do about stigma? And and how do you think we can help? Because it sounds to me now like stigma is cross-cutting, even though it might manifest more prominently one area than the other one. How do you think we can deal with stigma? Well, we're in the, we're in the age of the influencers. Mm right so if you if you have massive following and you have people that listen to you um i think persons who are really concerned with this kind of movement can reach out to these influencers to have conversations with them and, and that can be broadcast to their followers um that is one way of looking at it. we tend to be beings that copy behavior so if there's someone of significance in society that says, look, this is an issue. This is how I think it's important that we deal with it. This is how I would like to deal with it. And this is me showing persons that I too have weaknesses and this is how I deal with it. It goes a long way because I give an illustration. A lot of the times the persons who are really marginalized by not having access to the support they need, um, listen to a lot of music that speaks to their existence that they identify with. And the musicians themselves become role models, so to speak, in their lives. So, for instance, in Jamaica, um, there's a lot of crime and violence for the, 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 uh, the, the size of the country. There's also a lot of talent and, and a lot of atlasism that takes place from Jamaica. You know, Usain Bolt and Sherry and Fraser Price, etc., Bob Marley, the music side. Uh, and so you find a lot of young people identifying with that identity in the Caribbean. But when you have artists and these mega stars that says, listen, put down your guns or seek help if you need to talk to somebody or go to your pastor, go to a therapist or counselor, try and find a better way of conflict resolution. It goes a long way. So you ask, what do you do? I think we need to get to these people and have them help filter the message to their followers because their followers do listen and react accordingly based on what they put out there on their social media platforms. Yeah, and uh, I agree with you. And that was actually where I started from, trying to reach out to, for me, because it dawned on me based on watching some movies and the Nollywood industry. Uh, some Nollywood movies, I've seen some things, I'm like, no, we can't be doing this. And like you said, they have followings and they have views. I see 200,000 views or 74,000 views. I'm like, if only this, um, this platform will tell people the right thing to do or show them in the movies what things should be like. It will help a lot. 
And uh, this is also an opportunity to tell people that Colin is an influencer in Antigua, okay? So if you want to reach <laughs> I follow you and I know what you do. I know you have a lot following and I know that you're already using your influence to talk about you have been doing a lot to uh, educate people about men being involved in the lives of their family. And I remember the last time we were talking that you said you were a stay at home dad. Are you still a stay at home dad? Yeah. Well, in the sense that I, I work from home whenever there's consultancy to be done. Um, I do site visits, but normally I'm the one that takes him to school, takes him to aftercare, um, deal with homework sometimes. We share the responsibility because both of us are lecturers as well. Mm -hmm. But I'm the one that's normally with him to get all the conversations and the questions about girls and who don't like who and why he should not do his homework or do his... Yeah, so I, <laughs> I'm there with that. But that was an interesting experience as well, because when I share these conversations with him, I get feedback from people and that says, you know, they, they wish other persons could do the same because um, the whole idea is to, to let men understand that this is not unusual uh -huh. and that our, our women need the assistance and the help because it's a partnership right? and so that you you have a sharing of responsibilities as well. But as I mentioned, we are still very much in a patriarchal system, mm -hmm. a system that actually hurts both men and women as well. Right. And um, some persons as men, they, they think lit less lesser of themselves when they are in situations like mine. But I, I tell them all the time, listen, you could be earning six, eight figures um normally and look at what happened with the pandemic you know it just came through and shifted things you could lose your job and everything so if you're no longer able to provide are you that's that is that the end of your existence you're gonna have to figure out or you should figure okay i can't contribute to the family as i used to in that way how can i shift things around to still play an active role while contributing to, to to my family and we also need women to to sort of help support us where that is concerned because the demands are not only from society on men and men on themselves but their their women counterpart as well because when you listen to some of the songs and what women want and say what they want in social media and you think you can't fill that expectation that in and of itself is a whole entirely different conversation yes Yes, it's a, it's a, we want a lot, but we just, all we want is true love, nothing more. We just want, <laughs> that's all we want, true love. That's it. Um, Listen, Disney Channel has messed us up. They've given this sense of Romeo and Juliet kind of beauty and the beast, Cinderella <laughs> and the prince. Hey, real relationships are not about that. It doesn't work like that. Mm -mm. It's messy. It's work. There are a lot of mental mental strains that comes into play. Even even this simple thing as postpartum depression. How do you right. be with your partner when they're going through that as a man? Because so, sometimes you just have to grab the child, take the child, and take the child away, and say, "Listen, you you take some time off for yourself." But right. if you don't know what to look for, you don't understand that this is a part that you have to fulfill as a man. It's going to be a problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. So, yes, but, um, yeah, like you said, that's a whole, you know, entire conversation itself, but it feeds into what we're talking about and, you know, the words coming out of our mouths, the expectations and the support that we give to people who are seeking help and treatment. So in addition to, uh, you know, influencers, I think that one, uh, another group of people that can help us with the destigmatizing mental illness are people who actually have mental illnesses themselves. And that's why this month has been dedicated to telling that story. We had somebody share her story about postpartum depression last week. If you missed it, please watch the, the video for last week. Okay. She shared it. Uh, and uh, we also have somebody coming in to share the experience about suicide next week. And these things, you know, when we have people coming out to speak about it, and those of us that are not, I don't, there's, there's even no family 
that does not have one mental health or mental health. I agree. Health. I agree. There's no family. I agree. What, what I find out is that in Africa, in retrospect, there's some things, some people, some actions, some events that happen that now knowing what I know, I know that was a mental illness. And that was an undiagnosed mental illness. And if you look at families, you know, we're talking of divorce, talking of death, you know, loss of a loved one with the pandemic. So many people lost people, the isolation, you know, men, the domestic and uh, intimate partner abuse, um, you know, rape, gun violence. We have mental illness issues in almost every family. There, there is one that we're missing too. What is tell add it? And that is the, the one that's um categorized by religion. Yes. Because sometimes when persons can't understand and appreciate what you're going through and the symptoms that you're exhibiting, they say you're demon possessed. Or you have devil or you did something to somebody and they, they you know getting what's true to you. Right not understand it's a mental condition because let me tell you there was um a very interesting ted talk that i listened to the other day where the the gentleman he is a professor in psychology clinical psychology mm -hmm. and um he's also a specialist in brain scanning and understanding and analyzing that and what he said a lot of the times the 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 behaviors that we see are not the problem they are the manifestation of the problem spot on right yes so he noticed that there were certain things that were within the brain that were not fixed and so the person was behaving that way what are you saying if we can deal with that then that would contribute to reducing that behavior so the behavior is not the person is is their brains that's not functioning properly but yeah. nobody goes and scan the brains to see if the person who's misbehaving has a brain issue because they fell down a couple of years ago and did something they incarcerate them right 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 and i think this was one of the things my guest uh talked about recently uh and he, you know he he's a sportsman and he did a lot of things and he said if one thing that still surprises him today or that he's most thankful for is that he's not in jail because when he had his own mental illness issue, he didn't get the support that he needed on time. People didn't recognize that. Instead of that, they stigmatized him and and, and labeled him, and it wasn't good for him. So, um, well, anyway, so what we'll do now is you will identify three major groups that can help us with mental illness stigma. The first, you said influencers. If we can have them speak up on why people should support mental mm -hmm. illness uh and and you know destigmatize mental illness yeah. the second part is those who have mental illnesses themselves to come out and share their stories share their stories mm -hmm. and also the religious part i think this this three groups they can we can go a long 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 way and we'll just we'll keep talking if there's any influencer that you know will listen to me or come on the show to share or talk or do something please let me know yeah um, there's there's actually a group called mental health antigua or mental awareness antigua you can reach out to them on facebook and i'm sure they will welcome you because they have talks from time to time great great okay so to so all our listeners too please let us know and it doesn't have to be me it doesn't have to be calling an influencer like calling Colin is already doing his own but i would also challenge you Colin, if you put more a lot of the things you put out you have really really great content i learned from your post and your videos the one that you did that all oh, that was really nice but if you would also speak out more about mental health it would be great because people follow you people listen to you and people respect you I'm one of them. So please use your platform as well to promote mental health like you're yeah. doing right now. And thank you for all that you've done. So all our viewers, Oyebola, thank you for watching. Oluwatoni, thank you for watching. Okwe Emi Adeyemo, that's my husband. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, and to everyone, uh, I can mention all the names. Thank you so much for joining. Colin, this is the second time you're honoring my invitation to this platform. I do not take it for granted. And everybody in the group, we say thank you. So um, um, 
uh, so you want, I'll let you say the last round, round to, to round up the show by sharing one thing about the importance of decreasing mental illness stigma. Well, health is wealth. That's, that's, I can't say it any better than that. Health is wealth. And so we, if the healthier that we are, the better we can provide for our families and take care of ourselves because it's not very difficult as it is right now. And so you have to pay attention to, to, to not just your physical body, but your mental state of being and all that comes into play. Society demands a lot from you and you have to be in a position to understand what's taking place with yourself and being real with yourself and seek the help that you need when you can get it. You will be a better human being for it. So that's what I will leave with. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to all our viewers. Until next week, my mental health matters. What about yours? Bye for now. <laughs>